We want to welcome you from the Educator Evaluation Unit at MDE, as well as the School Support Office. Um, I am Joe Priest. I'm an education, education consultant working with Educator Evaluation. In the room with me today, I have Michelle Imbrunone, who's also a, a educational consultant with Educator Evaluation. Rebecca Emerling is on the call with us today as our Unit Manager and Educator Evaluation Specialist. I also have Brian Lloyd here in the room with us. He is our student growth consultant. Along with us is Mar Marty Snitchin, who's our regional support analyst. So we have lots of manpower in the room for you today. So please use um, the consultants and the group in the room today to ask questions using our Q&A feature. We can respond to those live during the webinar. We can also um, provide extended responses to those after the webinar. And really, as much as it is about presenting the content to you today. It's also about making connections with us here at MDE. So please use this opportunity to feel like you have a person or a group of people here at, at MDE that you know you can reference when you have questions around your educational evaluation systems. There's lots of resources that we're going to provide for you today. There are some PDFs available for you to download. Those are at the bottom of the screen now. As we move forward in the presentation, those are going to disappear for just a minute, and, but then they'll come back up at the end of the webinar. So if you haven't had a chance to download any of those documents, you can grab one now, and we'll also have them again at the end of the webinar. We are also trying to promote our work here at MDE through social media. So if you have a Twitter account, we would appreciate you um, doing any live tweeting that you can during the webinar today using the hashtag MIAdminEval. So it's M-I-A-D-M-I-N eval. And that's the hashtag we'll use to try to promote some of our webinar series here. Again, welcome and let's get started. So today we know we're meeting with a group of administrators and teachers and leaders from across the state. And we're going to begin with a reflection on instructional leadership. I'm going to give you just a minute to go ahead and read over that quote. This comes from the Council of Chief State School Officers report of 2012, talking about educator preparation and entry into the profession. So we want to put this quote up to start getting you to thinking about the idea is, what is a school-ready principal? And the idea of a school-ready principal really combines the ideas that are in that quote from the ability to um, increase the capacities of schools to be that person that's an essential catalyst for engaging others, and really the, the key catalyst to be um, a transform, transformational leader and change instructional practice for students. And really, we, we see the school-ready principal as serving a role that um, is a very important role because they are the catalyst that can connect others to ways that can serve students in the school and the community as a whole. We know that leadership has a significant impact on student learning. Research suggests that the total direct and indirect effects of leadership on student learning account for about 25% or a quarter of total school effects. So we know the importance of school leaders and school-ready principals. About in 2011, um, Heck and Hallinger started using a phrase called leadership for learning, which has gained the attention of those in our industry. And this term really serves as a bridge to school leadership, bringing together three important factors that, are, that can help define a school-ready principal. One is having that teacher and learning focus of instructional leadership. Combine that with the ability to build capacity within others. And all those, those things together working to transformation and really be a transformational leader to make changes in schools to improve learning for students. So, as we talk about that idea of school-ready principal, the person that's ready to engage others, ready to serve the school community, and ready to work outside the school campus to create opportunities to improve programming for students, combining instructional leadership, capacity building in others, and transformational leadership, thinking about those ideas as an instructional leader and the principal, how familiar are you with that term of school-ready principal? Here's our first poll question. Go ahead and respond. Are you familiar with the term school-ready principal?
Looks like we're getting a fair number of responses in. That's a new term for a lot of you. Probably some of those ideas I've mentioned around instructional leadership and building capacity around others and being a transformational leader are all words that you've heard and topics that you've studied. But the comb combination of those, the combined effect, is really this idea of school-ready principle. So keep that in your mind, and we're going to dig into that a little bit more as we move um, ahead in our presentation here. Okay, thank you. We are, just as your school and district have strategic plans, at MDE we also have a strategic plan. It's called the Top 10 in 10. This is our state's collective effort to um, imp implement strategies that will help our state be a, a top 10 education state in the next 10 years. Our work today really focuses around strategic goal number three, which is supporting a high quality, prepared, and collaborative workforce really focusing on continuous improvement through professional development and effective instructional leadership. We, we, our webinar today is going to advocate and, advocate and support your efforts to leverage your educator evaluation system to try to truly improve professional practices and student outcomes in authentic ways through best practices and evaluation. Again, I just want to pause here and just say thank you. Welcome again. Thank you for joining us today. It looks like we have our almost 60 participants on the call today. We're very proud to, to reach out to you. We want to encourage your participation during the webinar. There's a few ways to do that. We have the Q&A feature. You could ask a question specific to what we're talking about or some other question that you have around ed evaluation. We can, uh, we can respond to that to you now or um, after the webinar. But please use that Q&A feature as a way to interact throughout the webinar today. We will also have poll questions and some multiple choice as well as some short answer responses for you to respond to where you'll be able to see the responses of the other participants on the line as well. We have a number of resources available through web links as well as resources that you can download as PDFs. Also important to note is after the webinar you will be receiving a survey link to give us some feedback on our webinar as also to um, initiate the first step of the sketch process. Participants in this webinar series who attend at least three live webinars are eligible for sketch credits. So in the first step of that is responding to the email, uh, the link that we will provide via email. It's also on the last page of our slide. And just a quick note, we do understand that the participants on the call today are all working under different adopted evaluation models. So all of the, the guidance and strategies that we provide today are vendor agnostic and they can work with any framework. They're really just focused on best practices of feedback and evaluation. Oh, one more note about participation. Um, the best way to communicate with us is the Q&A feature. I know there's also a feature within Adobe about raising a hand raising feature, but that's really difficult for us to keep up with during our webinar. So for best response, please use that Q&A feature. Okay, some of you may be new to our offerings here through the Michigan Department of Education and our Education Evaluation Unit. So just to give you a quick overview of the type of supports and programming that we offer. We are, all of our efforts here are to help develop and maintain Michigan ed, Michigan's educator talent pipeline and support our educators in the field. So we try to do that by providing tools, training, and supports to help deliver effective instruction and support leadership efforts for our schools and students. A little bit more about our work here. Um, you can see the bulleted list there of some of the different things that we work on in our office. In addition to supporting schools and districts with educator evaluation and the measurement of student growth, we also create opportunities for teacher leadership and promote excellence in our field through our Michigan Teacher of the Year, Michigan Teacher Leadership Advisory Council, and Proud Michigan Educator Campaign. And our educator research department here um, works on educator workforce, re workforce research and talking about the pipeline of teachers coming into our field as well as mobility rates and things that affect um, our, our workforce. We have several white papers that have been published to, um, to help uh, educators digest some of the important information and trends that are going on in our state. And just as we um, build our teacher webinar content um, using our teacher leadership groups and our Michigan Teacher Leadership Advisory Council, we build the webinar for this administrator content based on the feedback that we receive from administrators. 
whether that's through daily calls or emails or when we're out on presentations, the insights that we gain from the field is what we use to create our content. So please, that's just another um, plea for me to engage with us, participate using the Q&A feature, and don't hesitate. And please uh, reach out to us via phone call, via email. We'd love to interact with those in the field and provide support uh, in any way that we can. And again, our priority is supporting educators. That's what we do here in our office. We do believe that educator evaluations provide a tremendous opportunity to move the bar and make things better for students and teachers and, and school districts. We think that well-functioning educator evaluation systems can promote teacher and administrator autonomy, allow them to make important decisions that influence their classroom and, and schools, but also provide opportunities to uh, make evaluations that are comparable for district and teacher use. We think that the use of student growth data for educator evaluation should measure the aspects of learning that are most important to the teachers that are measuring that, to the students that are doing the learning, and to the administrators that are overseeing the programs. We also think that uh, educator evaluations should include data that informs instruction in the classroom and is very meaningful to teacher and administrators. That's how we get the most value out of our education evaluation systems, is focusing on especially the measurements of student growth that are most closely connected to teachers and the work that they do. So our areas of focus today are really going to help you to continue to um, focus on your continuous improvement for the 17-18 school year, how you want to continue to grow and improve your educator evaluation system. We're going to take a toe dip into some best practices today around inter-rater reliability and calibration techniques and strategies that administrative teams can use at the building and district level. Our goal for your, this webinar series is really to help be your partner in your efforts to use your ed eval systems to improve teaching, learning, and leadership in your district. And again, everything that we've built in this webinar is vendor tool agnostic, so it should work across all of the frameworks. And again, one more time, just encourage your participation in growing your inner rater reliability and calibration practices to ensure um, quality feedback cycles are the norm in your building and district. We acknowledge that historically some of the emphasis on educator evaluation has been centered on compliance, getting through the process, and maybe focusing on the end of year summative ranking rating. We really feel though that leveraging the power in the process um, throughout the year can really create powerful opportunities for evaluators and educators to have powerful dialogues that can shape future progress and growth. We also think that these evaluation systems provide excellent opportunities to grow our instructional classroom practitioners, to support school-ready ready principals, and help our districts have learning leaders that can contribute to the learning of all students. We think that evaluations are done best when they are rigorous, transparent, and fair and that it's highly connected and informs what's happening in the classroom. And very, very importantly, that the measures that we're, and the goals that we're setting within student growth and within our teacher evaluation systems are closely aligned to the success of students, teachers, and administrators so that we can all support those goals collaboratively. And ultimately, the, we believe that educator evaluation is a key um, element of a continuous improvement process for our educators in schools. Looking long term, what are some of our goals for educator evaluation systems? We're looking to encourage best practice to get more aligned across the state about around best practices around educator evaluation, to grow our practices to not only be effective in giving feedback around instructional competencies, but also looking at social cultural pedagogy, cultural competency, and how to provide feedback and, and growth opportunities for educators through the educator evaluation system in those areas. We believe, and a long-term goal for us, is to connect evaluation systems with ongoing professional development, development continuums and really developing a partnership between professional learning and evaluation, creating a space that um, where all Michigan educators can feel valued and also seek inspiration from their evaluation efforts. Honing in on the purpose of educator evaluation, we know that ever, all of our efforts are really about improving student learning and helping students learn as much as possible. We understand that 
the teacher's use of effective strategies plays a critical role in learning. Marzano states that as much as 31% of student learning comes from the, the elements of effective teaching strategies. So as we circle back to the primary focus of educator evaluation, again, improving student achievement, we do strongly believe that our strongest leverage to improve student learning is to improve teaching and instructional practices. And as leaders and evaluators, we know our best opportunity to improve instruction is through high quality feedback, consistent feedback, and to encourage our staff to reflect on their in instructional practice to set intentional goals to grow and improve their learning in their classrooms. So if, just another reason here why educator evaluation is so important. We know it guides educator growth. This is done through meaningful dialogue around feedback and reflection, leads to improved skills and strategies, and really can guide professional growth, ultimately leading, leading to higher levels of student achievement. So what do our educators in Michigan say about evaluation? How are we doing with these big goals that we're reaching towards? So this, the information on the slide here is from a, a research survey that was done over the summer. Our facilitator here was Northern Michigan University. They surveyed about um, 1,700 teachers across, uh, educators across the state of Michigan. Almost 1,300 of them were teachers. And we had a great deal of alignment when we asked the question, what should the purpose of teacher evaluation be in your school? Administrators and teachers were very closely aligned in their responses. About 96% of administrators and 97% of teachers cited student growth and learning, professional development, and improved instruction as the main reasons for what should an evaluation system be focused on. We asked the second question, that instead of what should the purpose be, what is the actual purpose of ed evaluation in your school and across the state? We saw a much bigger difference in responses between teachers and administrators here. Um, about 19% of administrators cited compliance as the main reason for educator evaluation, while almost 30% of our teachers cited compliance. So we have a large group of educators in our state that are still compliance-oriented or have a mindset of compliance or feel like that's the main purpose of educator evaluation. Still about 67% of our administrators cited those other reasons around teaching and learning, but only about 40% of our teachers cited those reasons around teaching and learning as being the actual intent or purpose of teacher evaluation in our system. So this out really identifies a challenge in our local systems and really makes us think hard about the messaging we're using and how we can message, um, provide messages that help educators understand that this is a growth focus on these educator evaluation systems and that these are all a tool that can help us to grow, improve, and link to our own professional development. And then after we've focused on how to deliver those messages, making sure that our actions are aligned with those messages so that we're transparent, transparent and thoughtful about um, implementing our systems. So we're going to jump over to another poll question here, and Michelle's going to introduce that to you. Good morning, everyone. What I'd like you to do at this time is to uh, please take a moment to enter a brief response into the chat pod. Are you familiar with inter-rater reliability in the uh, current framework that you are using for educator evaluation? And I'll give you just a few minutes to go ahead and answer your response for me. Well, thank you so much for uh, your response, and it looks like a vast majority of you have some familiarity, but understanding that this series was built on uh, acknowledging that many of you out in the field come to us um, with a baseline of information. We built this series understanding that some of you may be new to the administrative ranks and new to the evaluation system, 
So we're going to go ahead and as we begin our conversation today, I believe it's fair to say that there are many of you in attendance who may feel some pressure, albeit implicit or explicit, uh, being the primary evaluator, and it's important to address the root of those pressures. Our unit, as mentioned earlier, is here to support you through this process, and please let us know how we may be able to help you. Our unit recognizes, um, pardon us for just a brief second, our unit recognizes uh, that as building and district leaders, our, your goal is to professionally develop the skill set of the teachers and or the administrators that may fall within your responsibility for evalu uh, evaluator purposes. As I prepared for the webinar, many of our participants um, have vast titles, and so it is with that that we begin with a general crosswalk of the terms, and we will be using uh, to move forward with our understanding. Interator reliability is not merely a concept that is exclusive to administrator, excuse me, administrators or district leaders. It is um, a general term that is used for rater consistency. Our teachers may also deal with concepts of interator reliability, and an example of this would be when teachers collaboratively engage in the scoring of essays. When a student completes the essay and it's graded, there should be a high level of reliability among the teachers within the same department who would score that same essay within the same grade range, all using the same grade, excuse me, all using the same rubric. The use of the rubric is an exemplar. For today's purpose, I'm going to refer to inter-rater reliability as the statistical measurements that take place by the person being the rater, or here in our case, the administrator, during the scoring, measuring, or the collecting of the data during an observation. So inter-rater reliability is merely a general term used for rater consistency. We're going to refer to it as the measurement of consistency across evaluators who use judgments about that individual. The rater is someone who is merely scoring or measuring the performance, a behavior, or a skill that is being observed. A high reliability means that those scores will demonstrate that those who are doing the observing of that person or the behavior tend to rate that person in the same relative order. Scheduling time is extremely vital to calibrate and it is not only necessary, but it's a vital component, component to the evaluation process. It is necessary to grow yourself as an evaluator. Think of it as your own professional development opportunity. It is a chance to build and hone your own skill set and repertoire or talent. Understandably, there will be content areas that are and will fall outside of your own individual knowledge base. But quality teaching and learning is what you, the rater, the administrator, are in the classroom to observe, to gather, and to collect data on and in order to be able to accurately assess, to measure, the behavior or the skill, which will come later during the summative piece. This element is especially true. Think of shared staff members and how vital it is to the system for both the administrators, regardless of the level, to be on the same page with respect to reliability and in the agreement piece. Otherwise, one administrator could be viewed or seen as the easy evaluator, while the other administrator could be viewed or seen as the harder administrator. That perception will have a negative impact on the process, albeit positively or negatively. How the administrators, in that example I just gave, from the different building levels are able to achieve this agreement is through the process of calibration, which we're going to be speaking about shortly. While we do not train on any one vendor tool, as mentioned by Joe just a few minutes ago, we at MDE we do know that both principals, administrators, and teachers, we all need to know what good teaching looks like. We maintain that you must drill down into your framework, know and firm up an understanding of instructional pedagogy, and have a deep understanding of best practice. This deep understanding must be translated during numerous conversations, and you need to have many of them with your teachers and fellow administrators. So that piece is very, very clear. Teachers need to understand when an administrator walks into their classroom, 
what it is you will be looking for. When you come in and observe, they will understand what the teachers and what the students will be doing. Questions and understanding of pedagogy, what the evidence you'll be collecting should look like in order to maintain and continue and foster a culture built on trust, you will need to be transparent and consistent in your processes. And I would like you to pause for just a moment and think about iterator reliability and how you personally conduct an observation between you and your administrative team in order to be in sync with your colleagues, how it is that you can work and develop greater consistency to increase iterator agreement. But before we do that, let's just take a look for just a second and think about evaluators using the same piece. And many of us coming from a secondary level may have more than one of you in a building. And thinking about that team going in and conducting evaluations and how important it is to all be on the same page. And so it is with that that we're going to go ahead and transition to that reflect and response question. Do you engage in calibration activities within your district or building that help build iterator reliability? Well, thank you for that. And it looks like a vast number of you do participate in iterator reliability and calibration activities. And that's great. For many of you who aren't quite there yet, this is a great opportunity for you to begin that process. And we're going to go ahead and transition to our next slide in this webinar series about calibration. And moving forward, we're going to talk about calibration and why it's important. How those are being evaluated may perceive inconsistencies within and across schools on the manner in which evaluations are being conducted can and do lead to questions regarding fairness. I have a quote that I'd like to share with you. Whether you're on a sports team, in an office, or a member of a family, if you can't trust one another, there's going to be trouble. That quote comes from Stephen M. R. Covey, the speed of trust, the one thing that changes everything. When you engage in productive calibration activities, you are aligning yourself to what our, our profession describes as best practices. I encourage you to see calibration activities not only as a way to help yourself grow in your own professional development practices, but also to support your colleagues and other district and school level evaluators build their own skill set and provide meaning professional development in the evaluation process. So calibration is important because it's essential for consistent and fair evaluation of those being evaluated. We understand that inconsistency between evaluators can and it will lead to questions regarding fairness. We do know that engaging in calibration activities will build evaluator skill set over time. We do know that it creates a common understanding of instruction by engaging and unpacking standards. And we do know that it provides a framework on how to provide meaningful feedback to improve instruction in and around student achievement. It can also ensure a meaningful evaluation experience for all those being evaluated. Earlier in this webinar, we discussed that there is power in the evaluation process, that districts have the opportunity to leverage uh, legislation around educator evaluation and see this process as an opportunity to support educators, that being teachers and administrators, and to live into the system that is built on the instructional framework. 
in just a few minutes, Joe's going to give you an overview of the state approved tool shortly. But most importantly, take an opportunity to calibrate activities a step further in just a minute. And we're going to see these activities that can be cited as professional development for administrators. And these can be documented as such on your posting and assurances pages on your transparency reporting page. And if you're a district that posts your specific professional development, please contact us in the chat pod for clarification on this process and we'll help you through those steps. So taking a look at inter-rater reliability and about calibration, we know that there's opportunities for professional development for administrative learning teams and district learning teams. And let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail. First of all, you're going to need to have a predetermined visit or a format. And to take a look at that in a little bit more detail, there's going to need to be an approach and we need to make sure that there's um, comments around what's going to gather and what's going to take place. For those of you who may be new to the administrative ranks, perhaps you may want to think about starting out with a book study or perhaps a journal review. That's a great place to begin. For those of you that may not be as new to the instructional ranks, instructional rounds, learning walks or walkthroughs are terminology that are interchangeable. And that might be uh, a great opportunity for you to get started. You'll see on the slide that there, on the slide there, that there are um, some resources to kind of kick off what you can do to increase your inter-rater reliability. That can also lead into some calibration activities. And in the next slide, we're going to go ahead and uh, move forward with that piece as well. So thinking about your own evaluation activities in your own district, please answer the next Chad Pot question. Thank you for that, and we appreciate you participating. This gives us a great opportunity, and while you're doing these ChadPot questions, I do want to remind you that if you've got ideas about opportunities for further webinar content, we do take your suggestions very seriously, so please go ahead and give us some ideas as well. And as we move forward with the next slide, we're going to start dipping into the calibration ideas. So calibrating takes, just like great lesson plans, it takes a lot of detail, it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of consideration. But we know that you're up to the task. So how can you start calibrating? Well, there's a wealth of information and some great resources out there for you. So a couple of ideas that you have is you can start using some instructional videos. I mentioned in a, a slide earlier about inter-rater reliability. You've got a book study. You can go ahead and start using uh, some uh, journal studies. You can go ahead and gather your administrative team, and you can uh, t start taking a look at uh, moving forward on those pieces. The use of instructional vid videos to calibrate your PLC or your professional learning team, and I use those terms a little interchangeably changeably because depending on your own uh, title, some people like to use them a little differently, creates a great moment to grow the professional learning of your school or district team. When a large district made efforts to improve their principal pipeline, novice principals valued the mentoring and the principal supervision highest among the available supports. This comes from a study uh, uh, earlier in 2016. According to a national survey, principal effectiveness is associated with greater teacher satisfaction and lower probability that teachers leave the school within a year. And this comes from uh, 2011 by Grissom. So what kind of calibration and inter-rater reliability resources are, are there for you? 
When engaging in activities to support calibration, it's important that a conversation takes place prior to conducting or implementing instructional rounds, learning walks, or walkthroughs. And I use those three terms interchangeably depending on your own level of confidence and your own background knowledge. For instance, you're going to need to work with your association leaders or ask for volunteers to implement the rounds, the walks, or the walkthroughs. And this can be done only when you have heavy groundwork and have built a solid foundation of trust and your school culture is right for such efforts. If not, we do have examples of clips of the instruction that can still be used for your professional work. The key in working together is to calibrate. And this is to increase your level of inter rater agreement you need to be intentional on the conversation of what the rounds, the walks, and the walkthroughs should include, such as the behaviors of the educator, the students, and you're going to need to keep in mind that you also need to include, or should think about including, what the classroom environment should look like as well. And some things to think about is, what would the educator, or should the educator, be doing? You're going to need to think about providing options for student engagement, persistence, and self-regulation, conducting frequent checks for student understanding, providing clear academic objectives and behavioral expectations. Some things that should be observables for students may include the following. The student will be making connections between the new content and prior knowledge and real-world applications engaging and learning through a variety of approaches and developmentally appropriate tasks with a variety of resources, demonstrating autonomy and self-advocacy by choosing appropriate learning tools and supports. Or, the classroom environment will observe the following. Support a variety of tasks and learning formats. Be conducive to collaboration and group work. Allow for smooth physical movement of students and educators. It is strongly suggested that prior to conducting walkthroughs or learning walks, a deep dive into your observables is done with your district evaluation tool. One suggestion can be to include dissecting out one or two of your dimensions, your domains, or strands that can be an area tied to either your district continuous improvement plan or your strategic plan or your building or school improvement plan. Overall, though, some areas that you can reflect on and probe further might include how does this educator engage with those students that are hard to reach? What strategies did I observe that addressed challenging behaviors? If not, what tiered interventions and supports did this educator provide to the students that needed them? What does this educator use to guide his or her instruction? Also, I would like to share an exemplar um, that I have, which provides a letter to the staff about the use and purpose of instructional rounds that you may find helpful and an agenda. I receive these pieces through my work with constituents in the field who ask that all district markings and building identifiers be removed. We hope that when we are out in the field and have an opportunity to come across such great work that we are able to share these out with you. And we do appreciate your willingness to collaborate with us and to allow others to grow in this important work. So the downloadables that we did provide for you, these would be noted as example A and B. So if you'll go ahead and pull those up right now, we'd like to share those out with you. What I'm excited to share with you is example A was literally just a letter out to the staff about instructional rounds. You will see that in this letter to the staff, it was pretty specific as far as what the um, instructional round team was going to be looking for as they were going to go through the building. You will also see that certain indicators and look fors were going to be mentioned. So the specificity is listed there. And so I did want to share that with you as an exemplar. If you'll go ahead and do me a favor and transition to example B, I'd like to share that with you. And I share that with you 
because not only did it provide an, a great agenda, because one, it listed out four different areas, which I know at the secondary level is important to share out because it did list all four content areas. But I also like the uh, piece that it did also share out a team taught piece, which I thought you would find interesting. It also listed out the three different grade levels. You'll notice at the bottom of example B, it all listed out what they were going to de debrief on after the team conducted their rounds. So I wanted to share that out with you as well. As we transition to example C and D, I wanted to offer this piece up for you as well. Example C is the protocol for video-based calibration. And in both these examples, that being A and B and C and D, you're going to need a really strong facilitator who outlines these pieces for you. And that, whether that's the building administrator, that could be your assistant superintendent, your superintendent, it could be your assistant principal. You're going to need somebody who sketches out this plan, who finds the video clips, who provides the details, who sets out and makes sure that you have an area or a room location that is free from uh, wandering ears or wandering eyes, that provides an area where you're able to debrief openly. So this is a great opportunity and this plan is sketched out for you as well. One thing I did want to bring your notice to is in the meeting protocol it talks about uh, in point number three allowing five to seven minutes where the participants have time to complete their notes. For some of you, I just wanted to kind of point this out to you that you may want to uh, provide just a few more minutes than five to seven. And one key piece in this aspect is making sure that people have a chance to not engage in conversation. You want to remain free from uh, feedback as people are engaging in the clips in taking notes and you don't want to create any bias. Transitioning to example D, I provided this document for your reference as well. And as you transition to document D, you'll notice that in document D, none of these pieces um, are specific in, in C or D. This is just general information. So for those of you who want to just kind of start toe dipping into instructional rounds, walkthroughs, or learning walks, this allows you a chance to kind of get in there and start very slowly, even if you're just using the clips. So as we've had a chance to take a look at inter-rater reliability, thinking about the importance of calibrating activities, I'd like to give you a few minutes to think about growing your inter-rater reliability and the need to calibrate, and how would you begin to engage in the, that important work? And we're going to go ahead and transition to our next poll question. And as we do that, please answer one of these questions for me. Please answer that.
take a look at the responses there from your fellow participants. It looks like there's a great degree of motivation towards looking at instructional rounds as a practice to increase collaboration and calibration, um, and also seeking out more professional development, maybe from your ISDs or your vendor-provided professional development, and also looking at PLCs as ways to support administrators um, to engage in these practices together. So again, uh, lots of good ideas and strategies to get started with this work. So we're going to take you through a few things here just to help you um, point out some opportunities for feedback. Um, we're just going to do a quick uh, requirement uh, review of some of the observation requirements that are legislatively outlined. And really, uh, the reason I want to point this out is because each of these um, required observations really creates an opportunity for feedback to be provided between administrator or evaluator and, and uh, educator. So we do know that at least two op classroom observations um, are required per year, and then at least one of those must be in, uh, unscheduled. We do know that administrators are able to um, allow uh, share the responsibility of evaluating and conducting observations, but legislatively, legislatively, at least one classroom observation must be conducted by the administrator responsible for the teacher's evaluation. And we know that feedback is best um, served warm and served quickly, so that quick, timely feedback is really important. Legislatively, it talks about within 30 days and that it requires a minimally a review of the lesson plans, standards, and student engagement, but we know more timely feedback than that is best practice. So real quick, um, we've all adopted tools within our systems um, to uh, effectively evaluate and provide feedbacks to teachers. Um, and all these are powerful tools to provide feedback. So some of the similarities across all of our state approved frameworks, um, they are all instructional frameworks, which means that when we've adopted these frameworks, we have defined what quality teaching and what excellence looks like in instruction in our districts. So that in, those frameworks are an instructional framework that can really define quality teaching for everyone in the system. The legislative requirements for those evaluation tools were that they were reliable, valid, and efficacious, and they've all met those standards to be included on the state approved list. All of the systems are process-based and systems-focused. They all use multiple rating categories within the rubrics and for summative rating purposes. All frameworks establish a continuous feedback cycle with defined feedback cycles that are specific focus on timely feedback and are collaborative in nature. And the frameworks also have digital platforms to support their use. So again, our guidance supports effective practices regardless of the evaluation model or framework adopted in your district. But it's important to know that there are many similarities across the frameworks. In looking at the approved frameworks, there are some important differences to know specifically to your locally adopted model. The vocabulary that you find is going to be different for each of the frameworks aligned to the research base that backs that framework. The performance indicator language and constructs are also going to be different for each tool, as well as the vendor guidance for the summative scoring practices. These are all factors to be aware of and items that can be um, involved in calibration activities so that we can have consistent practice and guidelines across these areas of difference. So to truly harness the power of your, edu of your framework and to help it to be a catalyst for powerful dialogue within your professional learning community, it's important that the evaluation model is the foundation for instructional pedagogy and that the framework um, is really the foundation that, all, that drives the work for PLCs and professional development. So how do we harness some of this power of the framework? There's one very important strategy that should be in place um, to really uh, assist communication and clarity around our frameworks, and that's to um, have collaborative work sessions where um, teachers and administrators are working together to establish common language across the framework, and specifically identifying look-fors that establish the observables that can be seen in the classroom to connect to each level of performance on the evaluation framework. To close the learning gap, it's critical. The educators first have a clear goal in mind and know what their success criteria is. 
what the practice looks like when performed at the effective level, the highly effective levels, and that helps educators know what, what they can take action on to, to shift their practice. So again, as we look at opportunities to, um, to calibrate, the, the opportunity to bring all educators together, looking at our frameworks and defining what that could look like in our classrooms is a very, very important piece of the process. As we transition to our next piece, I wanted to share uh, the quotes with you that you're going to see there. And the reason I did that is when we kicked off our webinar this morning, the quote from CCSSO referenced the school ready principle, the opportunity that school ready principles have to be the catalyst for not only their building, but their entire school community. For those of you that evaluate such leaders, I ask that you consider what can you do to foster and encourage the growth of district ready leaders, those that ignite and serve as a catalyst for the greater communities that they serve. Collectively, we need to consider providing greater support to those through the use of mentoring and coaching and through the use of constructive quality feedback for those that have been called to serve for their communities. We in this unit certainly recognize the job of the building and district leader, regardless of the title, is difficult and often isolated. So we're going to transition to feedback for learning. The reason we are circling back to this idea is to hone in on the idea of moving beyond that you're doing a great job. And while this may be true, deeper, more meaningful feedback is designed to grow the individual professionally so that it provides a quality and can be a framework to impact leadership. The power in the feedback needs to be used and collected from several different sources to inform educators on their ongoing impact to be instructional and to guide leadership practices. For calibration purposes, it needs to take place to be sure that the design for your dialogue uh, needs to make sure that it is framed properly. Think about when you're calibrating, what are your other PLC or PLT members saying and are they providing the same type of um, feedback? Take a moment to be sure that you remain present in your framework language and that it is being consistent in your district and what your district framework is using. If the purpose of your feedback to your teachers um, for number one uh, in that PowerPoint slide, the feedback to the question should affirm the learning goal. The feedback needs to tell the educator specifically what they need to improve in order to accomplish the goal. For question number two, it needs to answer the question and tell the educator what progress they are making toward accomplishing that learning goal. And for number three, it needs to help the educator know where they are supposed to go next as they work toward attaining their goal. Where should the educator put their time and effort and attention to close the gap between the goal and the current performance level? Relational trust and learning are at the heart of our work and feedback towards administrators is no different. Earlier, Joe shared with you the term by Hallinger, leadership for learning, which has gained the attention of those in our profession. The bridge between teaching and learning and capacity building is right now. And whether you evaluate teachers or are the evaluator, evaluator of administrators, you have the capacity to transform the learning within your district or your building. Cultivate the power that is right now at your fingertips and make sure that you are taking full advantage of that piece. Five areas for those of you who are evaluating administrators need to make sure that you are mindful of per legislation. On the next slide, a quick quote from Jim Collins, will you settle for being a good leader or will you grow to be a great leader? You need to connect with those around you. You need to highlight the standards and seek traditions of those around you, and more importantly, maintain those standards and don't soft, pe soft pedal. On the next slide, you're going to see a series of pieces of information that we've gathered for you to serve as a reference to grow your understanding. Remember, today is just a quick toe dip into those pieces, and this will serve as an area for you to reference later. 
Just as a reminder here, we do have some of the upcoming dates available for the Administrator webinar series. Today is day one of our six-part series. We do hope you found some value today and will continue to register and participate in those. We do also have a teacher series going on right now that is focused on em empowering teachers to get involved and really to have a growth mindset and one um, that helps them set goals and take action on their educator evaluation systems. So again, there's the link to our webinars, and we have a lot of these going on around. Please encourage your teachers and administrators to participate. Speaking of resources, we have a lot of them available for you at our michigan.gov slash MDE website. The, the, at the bottom of the page there, you can see our handy quick uh, address, which is uh, michigan.gov slash MDE dash edivals. That will take you to all of our edival resources. You can find our frequently asked questions there, our at a glance documents. You can also find our education research reports on evaluation, as well as a lot of tools around to support your student growth work. So if you haven't visited our edival website on the MDE page, please head there because we do have some valuable information for you. Again, everyone, this is Michelle, and I just wanted to say thank you for joining us this morning and kicking off our uh, first administrative webinar for this year. Please feel free to contact us. The chat pod will be open for a little bit this morning, and uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to join us. We want to say thank you again. Be sure to make sure that you uh, jump on that survey link for your sketch credit. Again, thank you, everyone, and on behalf of our unit, we wanted to wish you a wonderful holiday season, and we look forward to uh, seeing you at our next webinar. So thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great weekend.